Hello everybody and welcome back to Quarantine Kids Storytime. My name's Sasha Cooper and today I'm going to be continuing the tale of the White Seal from The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Last time we saw Kotick learning the ways of being a seal under his mother's watchful eye. Shall we see what else he learns today? One day, however, as he was lying half asleep in the warm water somewhere off the island of Juan Fernandez, he felt faint and lazy all over, just as human people do when the spring is in their legs, and he remembered the good, firm beaches of Novostoshna, 7,000 miles away, the games his companions played, the smell of the seaweed, the seal roar, and the fighting. That very minute he turned north, swimming steadily, and as he went on, he met scores of his mates, all bound for the same place, and they said, Greetings, Kotick. This year we are all hulas cheeky, and we can dance the fire dance in the breakers off the cannon and play on the new grass. But where did you get that coat? Kotick's fur was almost pure white now, and though he felt very proud of it, he only said, Swim quickly, my bones are aching for the land. And so they all came to the beaches where they had been born and heard the old seals, their fathers, fighting in the rolling mist. That night, Kotick danced the fire dance with the yearling seals. The sea is full of fire on summer nights all the way down from Novostoshna to Lukannon, and each seal leaves a wake-like burning oil behind him and a flaming flash when he jumps, and the waves break in great phosphorescent streaks and swirls. Then they went inland to the Hollis Cheeky grounds and rolled up and down in the new wild wheat and told stories of what they had done whilst they had been at sea. They talked about the Pacific as boys would talk about a wood that they had been nutting in, and if anyone had understood them, he could have gone away and made such a chart of that ocean as never was. The three and four year old Hollis Cheeky romped down from Hutchinson's Hill, saying, Out of the way, youngsters! The sea is deep and you don't know all that is in it yet. Wait till you've rounded the horn. Hi, you leerling! Where did you get that white coat? <laughs> I didn't get it, said Kotick. It grew. And just as he was going to roll the speaker over, a couple of black-haired men with flat red faces came from behind a sand dune, and Kotick, who had never seen a man before, coughed and lowered his head. The Hollis Cheeky just bundled off a few yards and sat staring stupidly. The men were no less than Carrick Buterin the chief of the seal hunters on the island, and Patalamon, his son. They came from the little village, not half a mile from the sea nurseries, and they were deciding what seals they would drive up to the killing pens, for the seals were driven just like sheep, to be turned into sealskin jackets later on. Ho! said Patalamon. Look! There's a white seal. Carrick Buterin nearly turned white under his oil and smoke, for he was an Aleut, and Aleuts are not clean people. Then he began to mutter a prayer. Don't touch him, Patalamon. There has never been a white seal since... since I was born. Perhaps it is old Saroff's ghost. He was lost last year in the big gale. Well, I'm not going near him, said Patalamon. He's unlucky. Do you really think it's old Zaharov come back? I owe him for some gull's eggs. Don't look at him, said Carrick. Head off that drove of four-year-olds. The men ought to skin two hundred today. But it's the beginning of the season, 
and they are new to the work. A hundred will do. Quick! Pater Lamon rattled a pair of seal's shoulder bones in front of a herd of Hollis Cheeky, and they stopped dead, puffing and blowing. Then he stepped near, and the seals began to move, and Carrick headed them inland, and they never tried to get back to their companions. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seals watched them being driven, but they went on playing just the same. Kotick was the only one who asked questions, and none of his companions could tell him anything except that the men always drove seals in that way for six weeks or two months of every year. I am going to follow, he said, and his eyes nearly popped out of his head as he shuffled along in the wake of the herd. The white seal is coming after us, cried Patalamon. That's the first time a seal has ever come to the killing grounds alone. Shh! Don't look behind you, said Carrick. It is Zabarov's ghost. Oh, I must speak to the priest about this. The distance to the killing grounds was only half a mile, but it took an hour to cover, because if the seals went too fast, Carrick knew that they would get heated, and then their fur would come off in patches when they were skinned. So they went on very slowly past Sea Lion's Neck, past Webster House, till they came to the Salt House, just beyond the sight of the seals on the beach. Kotick followed, panting and wondering. He thought that he was at the world's end, but the roar of the seal nurseries behind him sounded as loud as the roar of a train in a tunnel. Then Carrick sat down on the moss and pulled out a heavy pewter watch and let the drove cool off for thirty minutes, and Kotick could hear the fog dew dripping off the brim of his cap. Then ten or twelve men, each with an iron-bound club three or four feet long, came up, and Carrick pointed out one or two of the drove that were bitten by their companions or too hot, and the men kicked those aside with their heavy boots made of the skin of a walrus's throat. And then Carrick said, Let go! And then the men clubbed the seals on the head as fast as they could. Ten minutes later, little Kotick did not recognise his friends any more, for their skins were ripped off from the nose to the hind flippers, whipped off and thrown down on the ground in a pile. That was enough for Kotick. He turned and galloped. A seal can gallop very swiftly for a short time, back to the sea, his little new moustache bristling with horror. At Sea Lion's Neck, where the great sea lions sit on the edge of the surf, he flung himself flipper overhead into the cool water and rocked there, gasping miserably. Oh, what's here? said a sea lion gruffly, for as a rule, the sea lions keep themselves to themselves. Scoony, watch and scoony, I'm very lonesome, very lonesome, said Kotick. They're killing all the hollis cheeky on all the beaches. The sea lion turned his head in shore. <laughs> Nonsense, he said. Your friends are making as much noise as ever. You must have seen old Carrick polishing off a drove. Oh, he's done that for thirty years. It's horrible, said Kotick, backing water as a wave went over him and steadying himself with a screw stroke of his flippers that brought him all standing within three inches of a jagged edge of rock. Well done for a yearling, said the sea lion who could appreciate good swimming. I suppose it is rather awful from your way of looking at it. But if you seals will come here year after year, of course the men get to know of it. And unless you can find an island where no men ever come, you will always be driven. 
Isn't there any such island? began Kotick. I've followed the Pultus, the halibut, for twenty years, and I can't say I've found it yet. But look here, you seem to have a fondness for talking to your betters. Suppose you go to Wara's Islet and talk to Sivich. He may know something. Oh, don't founce off like that. It's a six-mile swim, and if I were you, I should haul out and take a nap first, little one. Kotick thought that was good advice, so he swam round to his own beach, hauled out, and slept for half an hour, twitching all over a seal's will. Then he headed straight for Wara's Islet, a little low sheet of rocky island almost due northeast from Novostoshna, all ledges and rock and gull's nests, where the walrus herded by themselves. He landed close to old Sivich, the big, ugly, bloated, pimpled, fat-necked, long-tusked walrus on the North Pacific, who has no manners except when he is asleep, as he was then, with his hind flippers half in and half out of the surf. Wake up! barked Kotick, for the gulls were making a great noise. <laughs> What's that? said Sivich, and he struck the next walrus a blow with his tusks, and waked him up, and the next struck the next, and so on, until they were all awake and staring in every direction but the right one. Hi, it's me said Kotick, bobbing in the surf and looking like a little white slug. Well, may I be skinned, said Sievich, and they all looked at Kotick as you can fancy a club through a drowsy old gentleman would look at a little boy. Kotick did not care to hear any more about skinning just then. He had seen enough of it, so he called out, isn't there any place for seals to go where men don't ever come? Go and find out, said Sivich, shutting his eyes. Run away, we're busy here. Kotick made his dolphin jump in the air and shout as loud as he could. Clam eater! Clam eater! He knew that Sivich never caught a fish in his life but always rooted for clams and seaweed, though he pretended to be a very terrible person. Naturally, the Chikis and the Guvaruskis and the Apakus, the Burgomaster Gulls and the Kittywakes and the Puffins, who were always looking for a chance to be rude, took up the cry, and so Limishin told me, for nearly five minutes, you could not have heard a gun fired on Walrus Islet. All the population was yelling and screaming, Clam Eater! Star Wreck! Old man! While Sievich rolled from side to side, grunting and coughing. <sighs> now will you tell? said Kotick, all out of breath. Go and ask Sea Cow, said Sievich. If he is living still, he'll be able to tell you. How shall I know Sea Cow when I meet him? said Kotick, shearing off. He is the only thing in the sea uglier than Sievich, screamed a Burgomaster gull, wheeling under Sievich's nose. Uglier and with worse manners, Starek! Kotick swam back to Novostoshna, leaving the gulls to scream. There he found that no one sympathised with him in his little attempt to discover a quiet place for the seals. They told him that men had always driven the Hollis Cheeky. It was part of the day's work, and that if he did not like to see ugly things, he should not have gone to the killing grounds. But none of the other seals had seen the killing, and that made the difference between him and his friends. Besides, Kotick was a white seal. What you must do, said old Sea Catch, after he had heard his son's adventures, is to grow up and be a big seal like your father, and have a nursery on the beach. Then they will leave you alone. In another five years, you ought to be able to fight for yourself. Even gentle Matka, his mother, said, 
You will never be able to stop the killing. Go and play in the sea, Kotick. And Kotick went off and danced the fire dance with a very heavy little heart. And we'll leave that there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Now, just to make it clear, obviously what you heard there today was rather terrifying scenes of hunting. And we do not encourage that sort of behaviour at Quarantine Kids Storytime. However, what is appreciative in this story is that Rudyard Kipling does make everybody aware of the dangers of hunting. So I hope you do appreciate that this is of the time and not something that we support. So thank you very much if you've got this far, and I hope you will continue to listen to the tale. My name's been Sasha Cooper, and this has been Quarantine Kids Storytime. Take care, everybody, and see you for the next stage of The Jungle Book and The White Seal. Bye-bye!